Welcome everyone and thank you so much. And we're gonna get right into it. Let's talk about the documented for sure things that have happened. I know you know some new ones too, Rick, if you don't mind sharing with everyone about these new um, things that we both just found out about actually, Rick, remember? Um, so I'll start with you, Rick, but everyone now just kind of jump in, join in, because um, we, we can question each other. That's what I want to do. I'm not going to be here asking all the questions. I know everyone has questions for each one of us, and feel free to do that. This is not a Q&A, so we can, they're just kind of listening to us. Go ahead. Well, the first one I want to talk about is Roswell in 1947. Um, I read the, um, a summary uh, talking points that the congressional staffers had uh, created based on uh, valid intelligence information they got from uh, the Def Defense Intelligence Agency and some of the other intelligence agency. I know this is going to upset a lot of uh, authors out there who've written books about Roswell, but uh, what, what they're going to release, and I think the first part of the full disclosure is going to be hist history or the historical aspects. Now, I can't talk about anything before 1947. I wasn't briefed on anything, but I was briefed in 1979 uh, when I entered the program uh, regarding U.S. contact with ex extraterrestrials. I read and was briefed by U.S. Air Force officials on the Roswell incident. It actually happened in uh, the summer of uh, 1947, uh, first part of June. Um, two crafts flying over New Mexico. Uh, now, there's going to be a lot of arguments on how they crashed, but two of them crashed. One landed uh, near Corona, New Mexico. A debris field, or the antenna off that craft, ended up Brazel's uh, ranch, but the actual craft itself uh, ended up near Corona, New Mexico, on a ranch. Uh, we know who the rancher is, uh, was, they're, they're of, course, of course passed away. An archeological team from Albuquerque, uh, University of New Mexico was there. They found the craft, they found a live ET. The ET was recovered, sent to a no number of different bases before they eventually got to, it, it got to Los Alamos where it stayed alive from, from 47 to 52. A second craft was found in 1949, way out west uh, in Catron County, found by a rancher moving his cattle up to a grazing site. They found that that craft is exactly the same as the one that they recovered in 1947. So two uh, of the same species of ETs that visited Earth around that time period, we recovered those crafts. Now jump ahead to yeah. some of the ones that are really classified. Um, in in southwestern Nevada, uh, in 1963, there was a nuclear detonation, uh, underground nuclear detonation. Uh, there was a lot of uh, classification um, along with that nuclear detonation initially. Eventually, it was disclosed that uh, the United States government, the Atomic Energy Commission, was just did a a uh, a test. Uh, in an area other than Nevada test site, that was primarily the nuclear uh, uh, test site in New Mexico, other than overseas. But the truth in a document that, that Congress has showed that there was a UFO craft that crashed near uh, Red Ant Mine, uh, which is in uh, Esmeralda County. And um, that craft contained uh, highly toxic material actually sickened some miners who found it uh, and some military personnel who later recovered it. Rather than uh, trying to get that craft moved, they buried it and then they conducted a nuclear detonation. You can check on this nuclear detonation and it occurred in 1963 underground, which destroyed the craft. Uh, that's just one of, of two that occurred like that in the in, uh, at Nevada, a second one, same thing, craft crashed uh, north of Warm Springs in uh, northern Nye County, uh, toxic material, some people were uh, injured or I think one person died, they buried the craft, Atomic Energy Commission came in and set off a, a large scale, I think 800 kiloton nuclear 
device under the soil destroying that craft. That's just two of many. Now, Congress knows of 12 in the United States and 16 overseas, but they're not quite sure about the 16 overseas because they can't verify them. They can verify the 12 in the United States, two of them, which I just mentioned, plus the Roswell craft. But there's many others that occurred in the United States. Now, David, I know you have a plethora of uh, information on this, but if you want to highlight some of those uh, definitive, definite things that uh, you're aware of, that's basically doesn't have to be public uh, at the point, or it could be already public information, uh, just so people have an understanding that the government is aware that you know we're being visited, there are crashes. What could you add to that, David? Oh, God, yeah. They, um, they've known for decades, you know, all the way back from the 40s, probably even earlier than that, but they've known of this stuff. Um, uh, that one that pops to mind, the acorn, I uh, mm -hmm. think it crashed in Tennessee. Uh, all the neighbors and everybody were out in the woods, and uh, they saw the Army pull up, and the Army said, that's nothing. They heard some screaming, and then, then they saw the a big truck come out with a tarp over it, mm -hmm. and it was a bell-shaped craft. And that, you know, those people should be up there and watching it. Yeah, because uh, they saw things, um, heard things, uh, but there's just so much evidence that they know this stuff's there, and I, and plus, don't forget the reverse engineering side of it. They not only know they're there, they're working on it. They've been working on it, trying to figure it out and and trying to understand things, and um, and I know for a, a fact that. Some of that stuff that's falling out is getting into mainstream science. Uh, just the sheer fact the way they were going after um, the meeting I was in, uh, they, the questions they were asking about fusion containment. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, yeah, what about it? And they said, well, pertaining to the possibility of UFOs, oh, I mean the ones that you guys got? Um, they want to know how would electromagnetic fusion containment would would intertwine with that. And I said, really quite easily, um, you already see UFOs and, and was one over here and it blinks and it's over the way on the opposite horizon. Nobody sees anything moving from A to B. It's just, it's at A, then it's at B. Well, what they're doing, they're not really traveling in a linear plane they are compressing dimensional waves uh, with this, the, the force fields that are involved with uh, electromagnetic fusion containment is just utterly astounding by what you get. I spent years, uh, 10 years just doing the math and I kept running into this one thing that kept repeating and repeating. I thought it was some kind of echo problem and uh, Hawkins even asked me about it because he saw it a couple of times in his work. And I said, yeah, uh, Stephen, I'll tell you what that is, uh, Stephen. It's, um, I think it's working like a, um, um, very similar to the three, four, I'm trying to get this down to where it's plausible <laughs> or understandable. The yeah. three forces that you have to deal with when you come into an atmosphere of one gravity field like Earth got a 1G gravity field and you got the atmosphere. So there are three forces you automatically contend with. And that is uh, inertia to move something. Once it gets moving, it's called momentum, keeps going. And then when it stops suddenly, it's called kinetic energy, which normally that's what kills you in the three. Right, right. Uh, so here you got a craft coming in at 5,000 miles an hour, does a nine degree turn at that speed. And they said, how is that possible? Because the gravitational torrents would be so severe, basically anything organic in that craft would be soup. And I said, that's a pretty good definition, what you look like. Well, it's because of the way you can do the, the bubbles of the containment shields, which is what I had learned to, to get through and figure out what to do. But in that process with that math that kept repeating itself, 
finally, I realized what I was looking at was an inertia dampener. And so I tested that you know, on a math wise on a board and it worked out. It, it came out and nulled out into the equation. So what is an inertia dampener? You hear Star Trek use it a lot. That's what keeps them from floating around in the big spacecrafts that they're in there, the Enterprise. They got artificial gravity and they need their inertia dampeners to keep those, those forces, uh, inertia, momentum, and kinetic energy off of them. Uh, when you're in a big craft like they're in and you pull up on a planet, you will actually feel the planet you'll feel it right through the walls of the ship. If, if you're banking the turn to go into a, slip into a, a trajectory for an orbital orbit around it, you will feel that planet moving past the craft. Uh, and then they have to crank up their inertia dampener so you're not affected by that. Yeah, David, speaking of that, um, you know, there's a, this is definitely 100% true. There is a craft that was outside of Jupiter, 30 miles plus long. It's been there quite a while. It's on a direct course for Earth, and it's going to be here, they said, at that speed in about four months. I don't know if any of you have heard about this or not. This comes from um, an admiral in the Navy and other um, uh, specialists that are in the Navy, and also heard it verified by someone in the Army. This could be a reason why this disclosure, they're pressing it now, because they're really going to have to answer to that. And as far yeah, as well, as far as the craft, you know, everyone's talking about the crafts and, you know, I've been directly involved with dozens and dozens of uh, crash sites, uh, UFOs, ETs. I mean, I've been underground and seen the alien reproduction vehicles that they're trying to reverse engineer, including what you're talking about, this, you know, inertia dampening, which I would like to also talk about this. I know Tim. Uh, you have a lot to say about how these craft go with their own gravitational fields. And I'll let, um, you know, I'll let Tim and David uh, talk about the little bit about the science. We're not going to spend all day on it. It's, let's talk about how these uh, craft do it. And also that we have already have anti-gravitic stuff. All right. We already have planes that are outfitted with anti-gravity helicopters to make it look like. And see, Rick is nodding his head. He knows he was stationed with me out there currently in Air Force Base Albuquerque. They had dozens of these things back in the 90s. So this is something I think people need to be aware of. It doesn't always look like a flying disc, okay? They can also project through hol holograms um, around a craft to make it look like that. And there's been many witness accounts. I've been on many sea uh, city expeditions where you see the craft go right into the mountain, but no explosion, nothing happens. Um, this is part of their, you know, they have really, really good holographic imaging now. And one of the, you know, in my opinion, when the Phoenix lights did happen, that was the first time they were utilizing a holographic projected image to see how many people would actually believe it. It was a test um, that when they were doing that craft coming over Phoenix, that was all done by satellites and holographic imaging on ground units as well. There are uh, occasionally people who experience that they, you know, come from one point and they suddenly appear on another point somewhere else. Uh, and, and, you know, these cases, people have looked into these cases, uh, they're pretty real. Um, unexplained officially, but this is actually what happens. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to add something else because um, uh, we're just uh, talking about that. So uh, another mechanism uh, would be utilizing the light, uh, the the actual light. Um, so so basically, uh, you know, Einstein he he um, basically came up uh, and assumed that nothing can be faster than light, right? So this is inside. Uh, while we're inside of, of a light-based universe, uh, we have a certain set of physical rules uh, that, you know, Dave knows about that. Uh, these are limitations, right? So um, uh, basically uh, what happens if we come, come close to the speed of light, everything slows, more, uh, slows down. And it's theorized that in the moment that we hit the speed of light, everything, you know, comes to a stop. But uh, we are actually right now living on the outside of 
light. Right. So basically, light uh, is as well a particle stream, but also a wave pattern. Uh, we right now can only utilize uh, the patterns, I mean, the, the particles, uh, but particle. there are actually waves uh, underneath the particles. So basically, when you open up the light, you can delve into the wave. And one of the qualities that uh, light waves have is that they are everywhere, especially, you know, in, in, in space. Uh, the light is in this version of the universe is everywhere. So if you make it through this barrier of particles and delve into the light wave, then you're actually on the, you know, mostly the zero point field, so to speak. So you can basically choose wherever you want to go. And these technologies are known. You know, this is the first time I've had Richard and Tim side by side. And it's been so cool because <laughs> Richard did an excellent job explaining something and it went right by most everybody. And what it was, I'm going back to that block of uranium again. Uh, the, as you know, the, the APRs make armament uh, piercing rounds. It's made out of depleted uranium. It's so dense and so heavy. Um, and yet, what Richard was saying, that big block moved. Do you know what you're knocking on the door of? See, uh, Tim was right. Everything slows down when you get to the speed of light because density. Density confines down on everything and compresses till everything stops. However, Richard and Tim just offered a different solution. If you're going to go to light speed travel, you're knocking on the door of time travel. <laughs> there was a project I got called in on, and it was kind of a roundabout way of getting to what I was supposed to do. I was with law enforcement at that time, and we, this woman was being arrested in Canada for trespassing, this black lady and her little daughter. And it was Chicago Police Department that called me. And they said, we normally don't talk to people like you. I said, well, that makes me feel good. <laughs> but he said, we need some help with this. So what happened? I talked to the lady. I went and, and saw her up in Canada. And what it was, she was in her living room. And I know she was in the kitchen doing dishes after dinner. Her little girl was in the living room playing. And she saw the whole house light up. It was very bright in the living room. And her little daughter said, oh, you know, little daughter was about three. She was just saying sparkly bright. You know, that's what it was. And she walks and the mother comes out of the kitchen real fast in the living room and sees her daughter walk into this white, you know, round shaft and boom, the child was gone. The mother being a mother, you know, just mother bear and she just jumped in the thing to go after the daughter and the woman grabs her daughter and stands up and they're at the stomatory in toronto canada and there's students laying in bed and they look at this black lady standing there and going ma'am what are you doing here and she holding her little daughter in there in the bathrobes she said, I pulled my child out of a light and I ended up here. So they call security and security does a normal thing. They went, it's a trespasser. So we're going to arrest her. So they arrest the poor woman. But here's where the feds got involved. Yeah. We tried to find an airplane ticket, a bus ticket, a rental car, everything that you could do, a mode of transportation. And there was nothing, no records, no word, nothing. And then we canvassed her neighborhood and they saw her only like five minutes before she's in Canada. And they're looking at me like, oh, can you explain this to us? I'm like, dude, I'm, I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. Um, but she did not do anything on her own. And they brought her back home. Uh, our U.S. government did. And Canada released her. Because it wasn't really, she didn't break any laws other than trespassing. So they, they let her go back to her house. I went back to interview her again, and guess what? The house is gone. Yeah. The whole house wiped off the face of the earth. 
chain link fence, big metal sign up on the fence saying property of the United States government. If you have any questions, call this number. And there was a number and I called it and they said, you know, I told them who it was. They said, well, we can't help you. We just closed it down. I went, so my theory, I had to sit there and, and colleagues kept looking at me going, well, what do you think it was? I said, you know, I think there are many, many very small black holes. I know Tim's been talking about a lot of these grays. And um, I mentioned on my programs, all the different species that I've been involved with that I've tested that um, I was directly involved with. And I do have to say what you guys said, there is one more thing that I noticed with the majority of them, they all have the five point star. So two arms, two legs and a head, and they are definitely uh, water based. Um, I want to back up Tim because there's some confusion online uh, a few weeks ago when he was mentioning the, all the different types of grays. And I want to say for every ET that I ever mentioned, there's so many different kinds of the same ET, um, which I want to point out. That was a yeah. great thing that you said, Tim, a couple weeks ago online. And that also goes for us. Look at uh, us humans here on planet Earth. There's many different kinds, uh, different colors, different shapes and sizes and that also goes into the stars so everyone knows so even though uh, i did mention grays at some point there's a plethora of different types of grays uh, i just want to get that and plus i also want to get back to the crashes everyone's asking me about the crash in nevada so it was right down the road from my house here yes that was real it was captured on uh, hundreds of ring cameras it was also captured on dozens of police officer cameras on their you know their 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 cameras that they carry on them and they did go to that house and there was an extraterrestrial two of them there actually but that was not a crash landing that was more of an emergency landing they had to land uh, whether they got shot down by our neutrino light detectors i don't know that information but i do have good information um here with the police and everyone that was involved with that and they did take their phones by the way they did install a government camera in their backyard just to monitor to see who's coming in and out and what they're going to be saying. Uh, so it's interesting to see what happens to this family a few weeks uh, from now. But yeah, that was an actual incident. It was also um, captured by um, Nellith Air Force Base um, with their radars and the same thing with the airport. That stuff, I don't know when they're going to come out with it, if they will, but I just want to bury that real quick. Uh, these extraterrestrials have the ability to flux in and out. They did camouflage themselves. Some of them were caught on camera. Um, the craft also was still there, it was just fluxing in and out, and that dematerialized later on that evening. Uh, there was a huge investigation, an ongoing investigation. So I just want to get that out of the way because a lot of people are <laughs> talking about all, and it's been happening actually more than often uh, here in, uh, in, in and near Las Vegas. Uh, very interesting things are happening, but they're not reporting it. Uh, I think there's going to be more and more of this, just not here in Nevada, but all around the world. It happens all the time. Let me let me jump in here real quick, because uh, I have a lot of information about that incident yeah, in, uh, uh, in uh, North Las Vegas, uh, the Gomez family uh, that occurred in uh, April 30th, uh, May 1st time frame. Um, we actually went up there, uh, two, two of our uh, uh, members of our advanced working group, they spent hours, uh, uh, many, many hours on the ground speaking with people, police officers, uh, neighbors. There's a neighbor in the area uh, that actually took two photographs of the creature climbing over the fence. Now, the cell phone videos that you see uh, I don't, I don't know uh, how they did this, but they were, uh, according to one of the uh, people at the at li that lives in the Gomez house, these things seem to come and go. But I think what they were trying to say. Now, remember, their first language is Spanish, and we actually had a person on the ground that spoke Spanish. Uh, they were relating it more like uh, coming and going as materializing and dematerializing. I think that's what. We, we figured that they were trying to explain. But the neighbor who, who just uh, uh, spoke perfect English, uh, he lived to the uh, west of the, the, or to the east of the house. He actually took a picture of the creature coming over the fence. 
It scared him so bad that he was going to destroy his cell phone. He thought that the thing was coming after him because he took a picture of him. But, I, you know, I never got into his house. He got into his backyard and then it, it, he lost track of it. Maybe it dematerialized or whatever, it, however it escaped. Also, we found out that the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, AFOSI, my former employer, uh, my former branch, the Special Projects Branch out at uh, Area 51, sent investigators there to the scene. Uh, one of the names of the investigators uh, uh, was disclosed to one of the family members because he was a, he spoke Spanish. He had a had a, a had a Hispanic name, and he spoke Spanish to him, and they remember his name. Now that agent actually works out at Area 51. So what does that mean? That means that the Air Force Office of Special Investigations is investigating this now. We also found out later, this is just uh, right around uh, just before the 4th of July, that a FISA application was submitted on the residents' cell phones. Now, FISA is a federal surveillance intelligence warrant issued by Washington, D.C. Now, you're never going to get it in FOIA because it's classified. Now, we got we had somebody uh, hinted to us that there was a FOIA request. Now, a, a application is a a, a request a, a for for a warrant. It's not an actual warrant. It's just a request. An application is a a, a statement of probable cause uh, for issuance of a warrant. The only person who can issue a warrant is the judges up there in Washington D.C. Now I don't know if there was ever one uh, uh, issued, but there was a submission of a request for one. Now, who can do that? The FBI can do it. Any federal law enforcement agency could do it. AFOSI is a federal law enforcement agency. Uh, the FBI is a federal law enforcement agency. DEA, IRS, uh, federal marshals. Uh, but we, we don't know who submitted it, but we it was suggested to us that one was submitted. Um, we also have a, a police officer who, who was actually retired now. He retired July 1st. Uh, he was a North Las Vegas uh, precinct police officer. He wasn't there initially, but he came two days later uh, with a team of people. And he thought that people were from the uh, Federal Terrorist Tra Task Force. But he found out that they weren't because <laughs> the two other officers are with him who were with the task force didn't know any of them. But they actually went in and installed cameras in this property. Now, uh, he's not sure if there was a warrant or if it was a surreptitious entry, clandestine or whatever, but there was was cameras placed inside that that area, that that residence. And um, now jump ahead to just uh, five days ago, uh, the family's in hiding. Uh, they uh, they talk by telephone to a to a reporter out of KLS. Uh, uh, George Knapp station. Uh, they also talked to a, a person uh, we who we know, Rebecca. I would just give her first name, Rebecca, who works for an investigative uh, 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 company that works with the History Channel. And she's getting a lot of information that she's relaying to us. And I would say that uh, if, if I was give a percentage of what was, if this was an actual event, I'd say 80% chance that an actual ET landed there uh, for some reason. I don't know why. And they showed themselves for some particular reason. And that's what's interesting because we all know um, they only show themselves when they want to, and they have that ability. And, you know, it's a very great thing that that happened, that many w people witnessed that, and that the investigation of this is broad spectrum around so many three letter agencies. Um, I don't know where else we want to go with that, but I'm glad you did jump in and tell them the up-to-date story. No one even knows about that. They haven't actually, that was the most up-to-date information, Richard, that the world has ever heard just now. And uh, I'm glad you did chime in on that. Oh, I'm, I wanted to thank Richard for previously that round of information off that document. Um, there, there, you answered so many, I don't know how y'all's brains work, but my memory works. I hear things when I was a kid, 
and it sticks like glue. I can remember exactly what I heard. And when I brought it back, Richard popped a whole string of things. When I was running around with LeMay building this project, he had a good friend named uh, Kelly Johnson. And in 1960, he came in and, I, you know, I'm a kid. You don't pay attention to certain things. And I just heard LeMay said, boy, Kelly Johnson sure got a bargain for $800,000. That's what he built Area 51 with. Started yeah. off. 1960 for $800,000. Now I can tell you one top secret thing that they I'll probably get in trouble with, but I'm going to tell you anyhow, because it's kind of related. I've got to give something back to Richard. Do you know what agency, or it's not an agency, institution that is in charge of Area 51's labs, it, it maintains them and all that kind of stuff, documentation, uh, historical stuff, replenishing supplies, all of that, Battelle Memorial in Columbus, Ohio, they are in charge of Area 51 uh, labs. And I learned that from LeMay. And um, people just forget, you know, don't know their history. LeMay was huge. God almighty, he was the uh, founder of SAC, Strategic Air Command. He was the inventor of the B-52 Stratus Fortress. Um, his nickname was B-58 Hustler, too. The B-58 Hustler, too. Exactly. Boy, very few people even know about that thing. And I thought it was a very pretty looking thing. A very sleek and aerodynamic, big uh, extra fuel tanks on it. But um, it was just uh, all this stuff that LeMay was involved in, and um, and people just aren't aware of it. You know, he was the chief of the Joint Chiefs. He was the guy standing next to Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He would have it would have been his thumb that would have pushed the red button. Yeah. And uh, so when he come to visit his father, he had a paparazzi problem. So he would only come to see his father, who was uh, 93 years old, mean as a snake. And he was at my mother's hospital. And she loved the graveyard shift from 11 to 7. He would come in at 3 in the morning to see his dad because he wanted to avoid the paparazzi. So he had to go through my mother to see his dad. And um, give you an idea what Irving, uh, Irving LeMay was his name. And- um, But David, David, didn't he try to blow you up too? No, um, he took a cane. He walked around with a cane, the old guy. And he was laying in bed and he would goose the nurses with the cane. He was a handful. And then he hit one of my mother's nurses in the back of the head with the cane, knocked her out. She came up to the front desk. She got this whelp on her head. My mother got mad, ran down there, grabbed the cane, busted over the headboard, stuck this pointed stick part, stuck it into his throat. Said, if you hit one of my girls again, I'll come in here and I will kill you and say you <laughs> died of natural causes. Well, after that, he became real friendly with my mother. So um, when LeMay came in, Curtis uh he curtis would come to see irving and um and that's how my my mother come to be now people would tell me this is all bs no that's true oh yeah well i got news for you i called up the retirement program of my mother when she retired from that hospital martin memorial hospital in mount vernon ohio which is where lemay was at uh irving lemay and um her records were gone. And a woman sat there going, I remember reading your mother's name in these records. They're gone. That was uh, Curtis. He swept through because of me and he took everything out. But there's one place he couldn't go. And I told you that. So it took me five years. And I have a document sitting right here. Uh, see my left. It's got a gold seal on it. It's from the Social Security office. LeMay could not get into that. And there is my mother's work records showing where she was working, Martin Memorial Hospital in 1966. And then when you take Irving LeMay's death certificate and lay it next to it, they all match up. The dates, places, times, everything. So how do you Photoshop that? So that's how I come to, me and LeMay got to meet up. It was um, my mother brought him in and rest up by those rest of that story. But 
I just had to throw that out for Richard because he said so many things and, and I'm sitting there going, oh, I remember Kelly Johnson, $800,000. And um, yeah, kid, you're not putting this stuff together. You're just here. And then, um, but uh, the, the, I do remember uh, LeMay being involved in a lot of stuff in Area 51 development. Uh, so much so, he cussed out Senator uh, Barry Goldwater, who was a very mm -hmm. powerful senator back in. And Senator Goldwater said, said to LeMay, I was in the room when this happened. And Barry Goldwater talked about it. He turned around and said to LeMay, What's what's up with those aliens in that hangar 17 over at uh, Wright Patterson? And what's this about some underground facility out there in Nevada? Whoa, man, I never seen LeMay get, you know, I'm a child, so LeMay never got mad at me. Buddy, he went off on Senator Goldwater and he told him, Shut your mouth, don't ever ask that question ever again, or I'll have you disappeared. <laughs> and I'm standing going, Whoa, this is not normal or <laughs> normal. And, um, how so, long was it after that, David, that um, you went, what year was it the first time you went to Area 51? I was there on June, one time I was there at June 20th, 1971. And when we landed there, the, you can see the markings laid out in the ground for twin runways. They huge, I guess they're like 10,000 feet. But what we landed on was uh, the taxiways. They were big as any runway. So we landed on a taxiway and pulled up to the center hangar. And um, everything was still under construction. And I remember the whole place smelled like a new car. I don't, you know, just everything's fresh. It's being built. Um, but I didn't remember one thing. That, see, my brain works weird. It remembers things. I remember the hangar. The, the hangars were strange the way they were painted. They were painted to look old, but they were new. Yep. And the the lights, the, the, other thing, the lights on top of the roof had louvers. So the lights would shine down in the front of the hangar, but out in the desert, but, you could look and right. could not see the lights. Yeah. And I'm saying, yeah, going, right. you know, weird thing. And then when we went underground, there was this one chamber, and boy, Richard, did you hit a nerve? I remember this. You know, you're a kid, you, you don't put things together, you just do what you're told. I looked over this big room. And it had glass walls all over it. It was filled with some kind of gas. And I started to walk over to it, and LeMay jumped all over me. He said, do not ever go in there, ever. And he goes, it's full of methane. It will kill you. And that's all we said. And I didn't ask anything else. But now what you just said, Richard, boy, I don't know what I was looking at. It's a little, little aquarium there. Yeah. And he told me, he said, the door is locked most of the time, but he said, no human being, somebody will leave something unlocked. If you see any rooms filled with gas, do not walk in there. And uh, I said, okay, you know, geez. Um, but they did get upset with me when I asked them the question about what they did with all the dirt. That really hit a nerve. They were upset about that. And I never could understand why adults would get upset over asking What'd you do with all the dirt? <laughs> we were about 200 feet down and you look out ahead and it was a, a rainbow shape, you know, causeway, whatever you want. But it was so long, you could see a hump in the floor, which was the curvature of the earth. And it just went clear out of sight. And so my natural question, first thing I said to them all, wow, what you got to do with all the dirt? Cause there was no dirt upstairs. And boy, they got upset. Maybe they phasered it. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. There was just the lighting was the other thing. I still can't figure this one out. So if anybody's got any idea, once somebody made a suggestion, which made a lot of sense to me. But I noticed when we got down there, the place was perfectly lit and no shadows anywhere. It's like a paint booth in a car. You can't have shadows in a paint booth because you get run the paint and not see it. Yeah, what that is, David... Like in the facilities I was in in New Mexico, all everything illuminated, but you don't see the light. They, they're using some sort of silica there's, crystal. Yeah, silica there's no light like, fixtures. Like chopped fiber yeah. optic. Let's think of it this way: one little light can can light up a whole house, but it's it's transmitting through micro crystals, nano crystals. One little light can light up the entire building. 
I thought it might have been the atmosphere. I thought, God, my, I'm breathing light. Is this is the reason why these things are lit up, but you don't see a light source, Emery? No, no, no light fixtures in the yeah, ceiling. That, yeah, yeah. that no is correct. Lighting, I've seen that too. In, but yeah, perfectly yeah, lit correct. and no shadows. And the oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I've always yeah. asked myself, why is this so bright here and there's no light source, actually? Yeah. That's interesting. The reason it sticks in my head is because when I got down to that thing they wanted to show me, this engine, um, when I got up next to it, I could see my shadow on it. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, why is that? And then I thought this thing was heat recognition alloy. The alloy itself could read my thermal rads off of me and put the still because when you move your arm up and down, your shadow's a split second behind you. Mm -hmm. On that's the because they're vibrating over 24 frames a second. Human eyesight's around 24 frames a second. And it's it's almost up to that and that's why you have that little it looks like you're going slow yeah. motion your shadow it's actually a strobe light effect of of, of the the immense light around you but it wasn't back to what you said they, they were just about the atmosphere or inside there you're like the it felt like you're breathing light well down yeah. in the underground um i'll just say in inner earth caves and stuff we did find a beautiful large large cave and it, it just glowed mostly up at the top of the cave and what they found out was when they took samples of that utilized using drones and they looked at it it was the same thing it was the crystalline structure of the water molecule that had a bioluminescent um charge and they, I don't know how that happens uh, I think it's just a, a electromagnetic reaction to that area so you're correct you actually are breathing light and the more concentrated it is in the higher parts of the ceilings of these enormous caves and we're talking thousands of acres that the light is just everywhere and like you were just saying tim the, the craft have a very very amazing layer on the craft that it just it's like a chain reaction it's kind of like when you get like this mwo over here multi-wave oscillator and you put a light right here it charges the light and it lights up without it being connected and that's what's happening in the facilities that's what's happening a lot on these crafts any do we know any reason why there's uh no dust on the surfaces uh of these crafts is there no. any you know yeah, they're, 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 they're negatively and positively charged at certain you, a dust cannot go onto that it's impossible yeah um, it was dust free it's yeah. repelling right it is yeah, repelling it, because of the electrons yeah. and uh, shiny. You actually demonstrate shiny. you look like it's just yeah. been uh polished yeah i was helping to develop the air cleaners for the space station and space uh, shuttle um in the 1990s and what we're doing is this making sure there was a positive electro uh, static charge and there's actually a company out there that sells an air purifier and it uses these ceramic plates you might have heard of this along with ozone and a far infrared frequency and they do this demonstration where they'll come over to your house they'll make a little sealed little plastic bubble thing they'll fill it full of smoke and as soon as they hit that button transmutes everything gone yeah. or it'll propel those uh dust particles right out the door you know where is this going and who's really going to be responsible for it you know is it what nation is going to take part of that or is it a part of a, a government military military industrial complex you know who's gonna like kind of head this up once things start getting really exciting you know we talk about this also a couple of the countries are dropping off like argentina was not who, who said that richard was that you no yeah 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 we were talking about other countries that were part of this kind of conglomerate um yeah. what, what was getting Rich access to some of the three letter agencies. And um, I think Richard, if you want to start with that agency. The incident happened in Brazil. Um, Virginia, the Virginia case in 1996. Um, and uh, how it relates to uh, uh, other incidents that happened between 1996 and 1985, uh, other uh, landings in uh, South America, Mexico, and also in the southern part of the United States, the uh, needles uh, incident, the needles uh, 
California incident. Um, and and uh, I think most most viewers and most listeners know that in uh, in uh, uh, Brazil had a almost like a Roswell incident. It was at Virginia, V A R G I N H A uh, uh, incident in uh, Brazil. In 1996, Air Force Office Special Investigations went down there. Uh, they came out of a support activity in Peru. Uh, they were staged out of an airbase in Sao Paulo. Um, and they sent a whole team, a DART team, down, down the aircraft recovery team. Um, one of the uh, agents that was involved, retired agent uh, Reed, uh, Clifford Reed, unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, he spoke at a UFO convention about this, so he didn't, he didn't go into uh, a, a, any great details because it was still classified. But the craft that was recovered uh, in Brazil uh, was brought back to the United States on a Navy ship. Uh, it was too big to be flown. Uh, I think the largest plane we had back in, in that day was the uh, C-5. And, and if if I'm wrong, David, correct me, but I... I think the C-5 was the largest plane. It couldn't get in there, and they couldn't take it apart. Yeah. So they so they put it on a Navy ship. They they transported to a to a uh, a port uh, uh, east of São Paulo. Put it on a ship, U.S. Navy ship, and brought it all the way back to uh, the closest port they could get it in was Long Beach, and then they they got it from Long Beach, traveling only at night. Uh, and I think there was some some uh, photographs taken of this, although it was covered, and finally got to the uh, western gate of of uh, Nellis Testing Training Range, which is near Tonopah Air Force Base in the western part of the, the Testing Training Range. It was taken in there and then uh, eventually uh, transported over to Area 51 for for uh, analysis. Uh, how do I know this? Um, one of the members of our advanced working group was on, was on the team, the DART team down there. Also, uh, Wendell Stevens had a whole presentation about this, including four uh, Brazilian uh, Air Force officers that were involved in this incident and that uh, assisted in the recovery uh, of this of this uh, aircraft, of this down craft. One of the things they found out that this craft had in it was when you, uh, the craft was about, 45 feet in diameter. And when you walked into the craft, it looked like the craft was five times larger than it, than it really was from the outside. Now, I'm sure uh, Tim or David can explain. I know I know uh, my former employee, Hal Putoff, could explain how, why that happens. But one of the amazing things about this craft was that when you walked inside of it, it looked like it was 10 times bigger. And that was an amazing thing that we learned. And I don't know if we knew about this before, but but that's one of the things that we. Uh, and plus, this craft had a had a had a, a type of atmosphere inside. It was pressurized, but not the type the type of pressure pressurization that you would see in an inside an aircraft or a, or a, a, a airliner. It was a type that it was a flowing, motioned. Uh, a system that protected the pilots, the, the aliens, from from gravity and from start uh, the, the, the the excessive G's that were forced on this craft. We don't know how it worked. At least back in that that time period, we didn't know how it worked. I'm sure we figured it out today, and I'm I think we probably have something that we've reverse engineered regarding that. We're talking about very high voltage electrogravitic fields number one, and those fields can create, of course, like we talked about, a craft's own density. And those fields also are an open portal. So size with craft doesn't matter. It could be a grain of sand because they can change their molecular structure and fly through the earth, through the oceans, you know, whatever they want to do because they're using what you guys talked about earlier, fashion and speed of light. And it does have to do with time travel. So there is these craft that they apparently look maybe the size of a house, but you get in, they're football fields long, and it is the craft. It's just 
inside inside these craft it's a totally different time uh, time disbursement number one and that has to do with also portal technology they get their energy from over unity free energy that comes from the fabric of space and time of course time doesn't exist but that energy is everywhere and that's why they don't want you know the reason the u.s doesn't want to give all their ufo files out is because you're going to prove you know over unity you're going to, you're going to prove that they didn't get here on gas coal and oil or rocket fuel they got here utilizing unlimited <laughs> dave's laughing they're they're looking at unlimited energy that means you can have any voltage you want all the time and uh, then we would be all off the grid and the whole thing i was always trying to talk to around the world with the leaders and un was well at least let's go ahead and get that technology out and still let us pay for it because in that respects, you know, we won't have all this this carbon in the atmosphere and kind of still kind of stay on the grid, but the power is actually coming from free energy. Now, I do know a couple countries um, that had tried to disembark on this. One of them was the Philippines. That's classified. And they get their coal and all their stuff, usually from Japan and other uh, other countries out there. And they noticed all of a sudden after a few months that they're not ordering, you know, the coal, you know, and there was an investigation because they're me messing with really big pocketbooks of the one percenters. And then they found out what was going on. So what they did was they're utilizing only half coal, the rest free energy, but they're still charging the person at the end using light bulb, the same amount of money. Now, if we can get everyone, you know, all these big wigs, all the megalomaniacs out there to, allow this to happen but still charge us we're doing a great thing for planet earth that's for sure um and that's just something i think they're going to be forced to do um either through a i'll just say i don't want to talk bad things but when a catastrophic event happens on planet earth they're going to have to utilize you know these systems to stay alive you want to elaborate on that tim yeah <laughs> actually i want uh so, so thanks so uh first of all i want to um add to uh richard actually because uh i've seen these things um and and they probably come from those incidents uh those are actually gravitation spoil uh spoils i think it's called is it spoils like the what what do you coils. call them in english Coil. what coils coils oh yeah coils, coils. thanks no. Let's do this never happened. Let's try me again. Spirals. Yeah, thanks. They actually <laughs> look like the thing that, uh, that Emery has uh, right in the background. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Some of the magic that Emery uh, always carries around in his 10,000 packages <laughs> <laughs> that he flies with. This is not a joke. But um, so actually the uh, gravitation works in a, in, a, in a certain way. So we basically have a geometric movement, which is actually ge uh, is gravitation. So uh, basically the fabric of space, uh, it's not linear and it's not fixed, but it's always constantly moving. And gravitation is actually looking like a spiral. So what these things are doing, these coils, is actually, uh, as you said, basically, the, the high current uh, is going through them, and they are imitating uh, this geometric movement. And you can basically see it uh, like in space when you have like a massive star or something, then this uh, curves uh, the gravitational uh, spiral too. Uh, so yeah, they, they basically... Uh, probably re-engineered these things because you can set them up to any gravitation that you want, actually. Look at the Van Allen radiation belts. That looks like a oh, giant yeah. Mobius around the planet. And um, that's another thing that um, we'll, we can get into later. The moon? Yeah, Dave, I, I would like to talk about that. And uh, if you would start to, because they're going to be really interested, all of us. Okay. You know, there is this crater in the South Pole you know, and you're you're an expert on this. You've been studying this for quite some time. It's never uh, been brought to the media's attention. It's definitely not been no, brought. No, not really. The, the largest people like us. So go ahead, Dave. All right. The largest crater that everybody's familiar with on the moon is Tycho. It's raised splatter all across the entire face. But around the backside, the second largest meteor impact is on the backside. It's down by the South Pole and it's called Aiken Basin. 
like Aiken, South Carolina. It's A-I-T-K-E-N, I can't pronounce it, but the Aiken Basin uh, is on the far side. It's the oldest crater on the moon. And, um, and it's huge. Um, but what uh, is so interesting about all this, that's where the Chang'un 5 probe from China landed and drilled down and brought up these water beads and brought them back. And they've used everything from electron spectra analysis to you name it. And they have analyzed it. And it's the, the crystalline structure is amazing. But what it's telling us that there's an ocean there on the moon. You just can't see it. Um, but there's more. Um, see, the moon does not have a core. OK, it's hollow. How could it not have a core? Well, if it had a core, it would have a north and south pole magnetic fields. There are no magnetic fields on the moon. And it's, it's, so there's no core, um, which that leads to a whole bunch of other things. Never mind what I think it is. I think it's a winter bago somebody parked there. That's what I think. Uh, we're going to meet the owners eventually. And boy, I tell you, you better change your attitude because when we went up there, we dropped 400,000 pounds of junk on the moon. Old uh, dune buggy, moon buggies, uh, lunar landing pads, uh, 96 bags of feces. That the astronauts you never achieved to blow you uh, like a nuclear bomb. Well, I mean, imagine, <laughs> imagine somebody lands on the roof of your house, drops all that stuff on the roof, and then put a flag up there and say, we're coming here to live. So they go out to an edge of a crater, call Neil over and say, uh, grab some rocks, get some dust, go home, and don't ever come back. You're a bunch of pigs. <laughs> so we probably got thrown out. <clears throat> but oh my God, we have Dwayne Ollinger in the chat. <laughs> That's well, so cool. The, Hi, Dwayne. The, the thing that about the Aiken Basin is so important is what all three countries found there, Russia, China, and America. They went over it, and under the surface, just a few feet down, there's this pile of something we think it's metal but wait till you hear the specs on it 300 kilometers in depth 2000 kilometers in length 2.18 billion kilograms it it's the size of metal it's a lump of metal down there that is five times the size of hawaii island and we don't know what it is and it's just laying there could you imagine? They said it might have been an asteroid um, core that you know that exploded billions of years ago, or crystallization of a magma ocean, which the moon never had. So I don't see how that could happen. But it caused this author named Peter B. James. He wrote uh, called the Aiken Basin Mysteries, and this pile of metal. Um, it. <laughs> The reason that's so important, let me explain it to you another way. I did molten metal in a weightless environment back in the 70s through a thing called GAS program, GAS, Getaway Special. Not making this up, look it up. The Getaway Special was hosted by NASA. And what it was for three, seven, or $10,000, you could buy a third, a half, or a whole 55 gallon drum that would fit on the inside of the cargo bay of the space shuttle. The astronauts would just do one thing. At one time, they'll go over and flip up a switch and then they'll come back and flip it down. So you had to build the whole thing it was totally robotic. But you, for $10,000, I got a 55 gallon drum and I'm using a two and a <clears throat> billion dollar spacecraft. You know, not a bad deal. So a lot of people lined up and they ran about 10,000 gas canisters through. Well, when one of those canisters was mine, well, actually, I had about 10 of them. Uh, but one of them, I melted metal. And then I knew we were going to have a problem because how you get this 2,000 degree glow worm going up there, and you're looking at each other as astronauts, and you're going, Whoa, man, don't let that get in your underwear. You're not going to like that. So, how do you handle molten metal in a weightless environment? You can't pour it into anything. 
It's like shoveling smoke or hammer jello to the wall. It's difficult. So by an accident up there, I learned to use sound waves of all things. And sound waves in a six speaker sized grid, you can control metal and shape it three dimensionally simultaneously. Try that here on earth, it's impossible. We have heard for, uh, from many US government officials such as Sean Kirkpatrick, director of the uh, Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, Lou Elizondo, former director of the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, Chris Mellon, former Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, Captain David Grush, former US Intelligence Officer, David uh, Officer, Dr. Hal Putoff, former director of Project 99, about the secret UAP UFO reverse engineering program controlled by DARPA. Can anyone talk about Project 99? Now, uh, I hope we don't get cut off by the government <laughs> for me going into Project 99, but I'm gonna tell it, I'm gonna tell it like it is. Thank you, Richard. In, in, 19, in 1980, uh, prior to President Reagan taking office, uh, in the uh, between when he was elected in November seventh and 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 when he took office, actually in January twentieth or whenever it was, he was briefed uh, by the Central Intelligence Agency on a number of different programs. He was also briefed briefed by Dr. Hans Mark, uh, who was the uh, Secretary of the Air Force at the time, um, and about the a a particular threat that uh, the United States has, uh, the United States received or uh, obtained this information from another source. Anyways, um, when President Reagan took office in January of 1991, his first, his very, very first thing after the Iran-Contra, uh, uh, I mean, not the Iran-Contra, the Iranian situation was taken care of, which it was already taken care of. I mean, the hostages were already in route home. But one of the first things he asked uh, the Central Intelligence Agency director was, uh, uh, Stansrill Turner was, uh, I want to know everything you you have on the subject of unidentified flying objects. I want to know everything and don't hide anything from me. Well, eventually, after Casper Weinberger and some of the others uh, Casey became director of CIA. The president was briefed. Now, some of these uh, transcripts has been leaked onto the internet and they're actual factual uh, uh, information. But one of the things that he wanted was how, how we can protect the, the, the earth from an alien invasion. And there are a number of projects that were already in the works, uh, such as the Strategic Defense Initiative. That was actually started uh, in a Carter administration of the ideas on paper, but Reagan wanted it to be implemented. He wanted those those plans to be fully implemented. He wanted a system to protect Earth from incoming, uh, not outgoing from the Earth, but incoming threats from space. And one of the thing, one of the projects that the Pentagon and Casper Weinberger started was this Project Ninety Nine. The Project Ninety Nine was a project, a highly classified project back in those days, a, a, a SCI, Sensitive Compartment Information uh, Project, that dealt with advanced technologies that we already had or that we could develop quickly, put in space to protect Earth from anything coming in. Now, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which you can read volumes and volumes and volumes on the internet, one particular document that was declassified from Los Alamos, you can go to Los Alamos and find this document on the Strategic Defense in Initiative. Most of the documents are redacted, but there's one page in there that says, uh, a scientist that was working on this says, we have to figure out how we can create these uh, satellite systems with weapons on board that can be turned around so they can be aimed at space and not just at threats coming from 
the earth, such as Soviets or the or at that particular time period, Soviets and the Chinese rockets or ICBMs. We have to figure out how we can turn these crafts around so these weapon systems can be pointed into space. Now, if you read that, it's just a paragraph that makes you think of, well, it's already, you know what the other redacted stuff is, is we have a threat coming in. Now, you know that Reagan has talked about this uh, on a number of occasions uh, to the United Nations, to private enterprises, to, 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 to speeches that he gave uh, to the Central Intelligence Agency, classified speeches, uh, to the Pentagon, that he knew about this threat. He was worried about this threat. But one of the things that we don't know is what particular ET race was we what were, were we worried about? Now, I, I don't know that. Maybe Tim knows. I know Tim wasn't around back in those days, but maybe uh, Tim knows. I, I've, I've never found any any literature. I haven't found anybody that actually will talk about it. I mean, I know people who are with our working group that was around back then and worked for the Pentagons, even some way before that. I have a good friend that lives right here in Albuquerque, just down, down the street from me, who worked for the Central Intelligence Agency for 35 years and knows everything there is, but he won't seem to talk about that either. So my question to Tim is, do you know anything about that threat? And what particular species of aliens were we worried, worried about back in the, the 80s? The 80s, oh my goodness. Um, I actually wanted to, to speak about something, uh, about another threat, um, which I assume is, um, very, um, yeah, it, it seems to be something that is currently happening and, and this has to do, uh, with the European story and history too. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm, you, you see, I'm, I'm a little, you know, collecting my words here, but, um, it's not such an easy topic and um i know people you know uh probably don't like when i speak about it but i'm trying to be as diplomatic as possible and we're only like um 100 people here so i'm you will never ever see me um talk about it uh publicly um but recently one of the disclosure episodes um we had randy kramer and he talked about certain things and I received a ton of messages of people who were really uh, fearful uh, because he spoke about an um, you know upcoming imminent fake invasion scenario. Uh, he also brought up um, a certain um, you know uh, parts of the history, um, and I just want to you know clarify some things uh, because I feel like this is like uh, so. To my knowledge, this is one of the uh, the highest ranking, you know, threats, things uh, that we have to deal with right now. And this is not like ET threats, uh, but this is like uh, in a, you know, uh, earthly uh, political stuff. And this has to do with uh, the, the World War II history. Um, so basically, I've been uh, looking into documents, documents, uh, some years ago and uh there's evidence that um uh parts of the you know jen is gonna laugh now i'm, I'm loving it the other germans you know the the germans from from back in the days um they made it to antarctica there's a lot of documents that i've seen that have never made it public but uh there's a lot of you know evidence to that um and I know Randy Kramer brings this up and uh this is some this is one of the you know high class um security things that uh really concerns people a lot uh and it also brings a lot of questions because um as you know uh these uh the the other Germans from from back in the days uh were elected um they were uh democratically voted into that um, they always had an interest in, in, uh, you know, the, the geographical location in Germany, you know, in Europe, uh, Tim doesn't want to say the word Nazi. Yeah. Let's say Nazi. <laughs> it's okay. Richard. Doty I'm, I'm from, I'm from Germany. We don't say the, we don't say this word. We don't say the N word. Okay. You know, you're from America. We don't say that. So, 
uh okay so um basically um yeah these people it it seems like uh there are a lot of lot of documents that state and and give evidence that they exist um they are counted in in the millions today like uh the last thing that i've read is uh seven million people which is not a great you know grand size uh nation it's not comparable to uh to the the russians uh, for example or something um it's uh, but those people you know they they were technologically ahead of everyone else in 1945 uh, uh and they never stopped doing that they constantly worked on things um and they are still you know they still have an interest in in reoccurring uh in, you know in this the scenery that we have and i know that you know they are considered like one of the num like a number one threat in some kind of way because um there are also treaties going on galactic wise and um uh you actually have a certain set of laws that things you know people that come from earth are treated differently than you know people that come from another star system and come into earth uh and these you know other germans uh they are you know earth people just like anyone else so uh they are considered a certain threat and randy kramer uh you know he delved into that and bursted out a lot of things that he felt you know was right or not and um and i just wanted to to talk about that and it's, it's a really difficult situation a really difficult topic again because i don't want to you know uh we all you know like randy um he's a good cool guy but uh he also you know frightened a lot of people and um so i, I just want to want to go into that in some kind of way it's also a really complicated situation because we're dealing with a certain international law in europe uh which means um that what happens to europe you know what uh who's owning this place right now so this is like a law situation that is also uh really uh really complicated too um yeah and again i wouldn't talk about that publicly but we see like uh russia is being addressed in some kind of way russia's uh you know uh fighting currently in the ukraine and is uh you know spending a lot of uh its in front infrastructure on that um there are certain strategies in the background to politically um to not you know make russia rise again uh and we have a a similar situation going on uh with europe too um but i also saw that rennie was really uh, you know going into the scenario that it could be like a fake invasion so 2015 we had a grand meeting of a lot of actually all the power plays that could come up the uh the u.s uh i think the u.s marines and navy uh they were mostly the uh giving the initiative and bringing people together uh and they these people they all agreed upon the disclosure project that is going on currently um and they actually agreed upon a certain you know a certain project a certain plan how to bring soft disclosure forward things that we're seeing currently uh it's going to happen on the national level uh rick and i talked about this uh earlier this week in emory too um uh we're gonna see that the national level uh is actually in response to what's happening so that being said that being said um the germans have looked extensively into the scenario of a fake invasion and uh we actually wrote such a fake document about it and we saw that it's going to be like a super chaotic uncontrollable situation that is not good for the planet at all and they agreed and brought in their input uh that a soft disclosure would be the thing that we're gonna have like 
what we called or what is translation is translated to independent field operator status that means that individuals coming forward bringing forward information and so on and through a lot of certain small cases we then you know have the population of earth prepared for what's going on um we have pretty much agreed that false flag invasion scenario would be absolutely catastrophic and not work at all uh, because of the psyche of how people would react how they would totally burst out into chaos um, so I, I just want to say that to everyone who's afraid in some kind of way uh, that these are the things that should not occur and I want to calm everyone down and again I want to also say that uh, Randy is and again I'm not you know, I, I like Randy. He's one of the reasons uh, why I do what I do, uh, because I saw him talk on, on Cosmic Disclosure and someone came to me and, and you know, things are happening. So uh, I just want to say that he put it in a way that there are only like two solutions, like two sides, like it's going to be the thing and you have to decide if you're for the, the, the Earth people or if you're for uh the the invasion people and that is not the case there are ma many many more people groups involved we have hundreds not maybe even thousands of different terran like earthly and non-earthly groups out there and i know that there are also plans for you know stepping into what's happening here on the planet if anyone is, you know, going off the path, and people should keep that into in their minds. I know there are certain, you know, evacuation plans. There are certain emergency plans. All this stuff is in the background. And the reason why we only see like a certain small amount of, you know, little incidents here and there is because these people are waiting. These these civilizations, these groups are waiting, uh, and they are taking small steps and observing. Many scholars have predicted this fake and alien invasion um, throughout the years. And uh, touching once again what Rick said, uh, Reagan did make an announcement, I think, Rick, at the UN saying, you know, how all of our differences would be put aside if there was an evil alien threat. And that was back in, what year was that? 1983, uh, I believe. Yeah, I was like 83, 84. So it's the awareness is extraterrestrials do exist. Um, even the Pope came forward and said, you know, extraterrestrials do exist. They're children of God, Alibaba. And, um, you know, no one talks about it, you know. So there is an awareness. And I'm glad for all of you to be here for that awareness because we need more information out to the public. And I can guarantee you right now, there are government people watching this and listening with a very keen ear, not just because they're watching Richard, David, and I, and Tim not to say certain things, because we're not going to do that, because it has to unfold in a safe way that's safe for the planet. And there's things we can talk about and things we can't, but it's not like we're holding everything back. There's times for everything, and everyone has to do it. You know, we all have to shift happily now educationally because because if we don't and we try to bum rush it and one person's saying this another person's saying that it's going to get into another conflict of interest and that's what we don't want to do the united states came over to uh uk in the 1980s and trained the sas with special tactics dealing with extraterrestrials so that's one now uh, we also heard that uh, they've done that with D the Danish army, the, the Norwegian army, uh, but I don't have any firsthand knowledge of that. So we have pe we're preparing. Uh, we, we did prepare, but the way I look at it personally is if if an ET race, any of these five ET races that I know about, if they wanted to destroy planet Earth or kill all humans, they would have already done that. <laughs> Uh, years ago uh and so i don't think they're here for that reason i think they're here for some other reason and whether we can get inside their minds and understand them i don't think so 
I mean, they're different. They're alien species coming from a different planet, different biology, a different anatomy, uh, different lifestyles. It would be very difficult to, for us to, to foresee what they're going to do to, to, to planet Earth. What country has the most connection with ETs over the past 100 years, and who is the head with this contact? I'll, I'll let uh, all of you take over this because it's multiple countries. I don't think there's a one single individual. Uh, you know, you, Tim, this is kind of up your alley too. Yeah, um, sure. So uh, yeah, basically the, the, the other Germans, uh, they started this. Um, they had one of the first, you know, contacts um, or, or they looked into this. Um, I would say the U.S. Uh, comes next. They they were the second country uh, who became aware of that. Um, then the ETs actually, you know, came over to Russia. Russia um, had a lot of the documents that were once in Berlin. Berlin had this uh, um, library, uh, if you want to call it like that. So the the, the Nazis. Uh, the Nazis, I'm sorry, the Nazis uh, collected a lot of the stuff and they they had in Berlin, they had this uh, library and part of the stuff uh, went to the Americans, part of the stuff went uh, to the Russians. The Russians were kind of lazy about it. Uh, they they uh, didn't look into, didn't look into the files as, um, you know, uh, as uh, as cleanly as the, the, uh, the US side did. So they uh, kind of kind of were a little you know the u.s were a little ahead um but the ats con contacted russia too uh china has a huge uh you know interest in the et phenomena too um yeah those are the the main big players right. yeah next question is nikki lynn um this is probably for richard here do you know about the bars that were found at the roswell crash that my father uh, was in con was uh, in contact with. Let's just say I lost it. Hold on. So I don't know about these these bars. Um, uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. The crash site, the Corona crash site in '47. There were a number of things recovered from the uh, extraterrestrial craft: uh, the communications device, uh, the energy device, um, some other uh, tools uh, that were used to facilitate. Uh, certain uh, uh, things inside the craft were found. Now, we didn't know what they were initially. It took some time for us to figure out what, what each one was what, what, what used for. But fortunately, we had an even. We had a live yeah. ET that was in captivity, captivity from 47 52. And he somehow explained what some of these devices were. But as far as the bars go, I think you're talking about the 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 items that uh, were used to uh, facilitate uh, or repair the the craft uh, in 1981, I was investigating the Paul Benowitz case, the Calvary Canyon case, many other cases involving UFOs, UAPs. Back then, it was UFOs, and um, one day, and then we we uh, in the Paul Benowitz case, we got uh, Myrna Hansen involved. She became involved in that case. She had been a uh, abductee that brought was brought to us by uh, Paul Benowitz. She'd already uh, been seen by Dr. Ellen Hynek, Leo Sprinkle. Anyways, um, one day I'm in my office, the OSI office, and uh, my our security person called me and said, you got two people from uh, headquarters here to see you. And I said, well, who are they? And they told me, he, she, the security officer gave us, gave me the names. I didn't know who they were. And he, I said, well, did you check their badges? Are they, yeah, yeah, they're cleared. So they come in my office and I said, yeah. And I shook their hands and they introduced themselves. I said, what, what can I do for you guys? They said, yeah, we're here for, on a, a Myrna Hansen case. I said, you're here from where? <laughs> from DIA. I said, Oh, oh, DIA is in Defense Intelligence Agency now. Is interested in this case? Yeah, we're from the, uh, and he gave me the code uh, for a particular office. And I said, what, what's that office do? He says, we investigate abductions. And before this, I had never been briefed into abductions. I didn't know they existed. Uh -huh. And I said, you mean to tell me abductions are real? <laughs> and, and they both <laughs> looked at me and said, yeah, they are. And I said, oh, my God. And he said, you're not briefed into it. And and so now we're in a, a conundrum there because 
here they're in my office asking me for information about something that I'm not cleared for. So, so they had to clear me and then they got me right into the program. And then that's when I realized that abductions were real and that they really were happening and they uh, were involved in extraterrestrials. Now, as something Dave uh, uh, Emery said, uh, there are a lot of fake abductions out there. There are a lot of people who claim they were abducted and never were. Uh, they want publicity, they want whatever. Uh, but uh, there are legitimate abductions. I investigated many of them after I was briefed into the program. And so there's a phenomenon out there, abduction phenomena that's real. Now, who's doing the abduction? Uh, they all seem to be, as Emery said, gray. Oh. Now, we I always thought that the Evans, the gray Evans from the Roswell cra crash site, were the uh, benevolent ones. They were the, the nice ones, the friendly ones. They wouldn't hurt a soul. At least that's what Evil One told us, uh, the one that we found in the spacecraft. But uh, why are all the abductions being done by these gray? He looked into that. So uh, basically we've counted in 2000, uh, I don't know, uh, 20s around something, 18 or something, I don't know. So we have 30,000 uh cases of abduction in germany alone per year uh and these are not including uh you know the the uncountable cases uh in the dark you know so uh basically the numbers are estimated between the thirty thousand that we have proof of and probably a million or so cases uh per year in germany alone at that time uh like I don't know, 10, maybe 10 years ago or something. So, uh, and remember, Germany has about 80 million people. So it's it's a huge amount of people who get contacted. Uh, it varies. We have like this part here over here, which is, uh, you know, dark and shady and not so cool to look at. And then we have a huge part of contact scenarios that are pretty benevolent where people get, chipped and not all the chipping is you know most of it is is benevolent to to keep track of people and and so forth um but we also have this you know appendix of bad stuff happening um i don't want to go into that case because uh that's you know i don't know but but this case the the majority of the cases um they're they're benevolent uh, the Greys actually, um, they sell these scenarios. They offer them as a service to, to other species and to other groups. Uh, and mostly the reason why is because you have a million, like 100 million of peop people here uh, that, you know, have some kind of relationship to other planets, to other species. Uh you know, I've heard from our community the term starseed, and I love it. So um, talk about 100 million starseeds, 150 million starseeds on this planet. And they make sure that they get contacted. Not all the species are suitable for that. Um, the grays actually operate on these fiber-printed beings, and uh, they are made... And they, this is the reason why they are gray. They are these gray beings are made for this planet. They have other t colors too that they use for other planets. But that's the reason. So um, is this still happening? Uh, well, the these groups, uh, the Earth, you know, the government side uh, actually um, forbid it some kind of way, said it's not OK. So it should not be happening. Why do they need humans from Earth? Is there a, you know, with the embargo stuff going on that, of course, Randy talks about, you talk about it clandestinely, which I, I respect very much. So, you know, there's so many reasons for that. Uh, it really depends. So, uh, again, we're all part of the same singular life form, which is the universe, right? Um, so, uh, our evolution. There are there are certain cases in our on our planet of people who have a certain uh, pre-programmed destiny, and these are important. Uh, and these are the ones that are being, you know, taken care of. You have uh, certain beings that are connected to other um, non-terrestrial intelligence because they are 
offspring or hybrids or connected in, in some kind of way. So the reasons, like you have a multitude of reasons um, yeah. and, and the, the, the big majority of cases that we looked into uh, were looking kind of scary, but in that, you know, in reality, they were taken care of. Uh, yeah. Some okay. Kind of way. I get it. I got a question for uh, Richard. Um, you know, I was called out with the Stan Romanek thing. Um to see some things and go over some files. And I actually uh, did some wound care on him later on uh, with my uh, technology. I was in contact with, uh, I think it was his sister or cousin or something. Uh, you know, that is a type of unfolding, looks like it's staged, you know, they did find canisters, everything was melted inside the microwave, the cans or whatever. This little guy peeping up and down the window, you guys don't know about, look up Stan Romanek. Um, that for me was an op, that's an op. And why they're going after him, there's many reasons. And then he turned it into a publicity stunt. And did you ever hear any legitimacy to the Stan Romanek thing or inside about why they targeted him? Mm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, <laughs> there was certain know. information, there was certain information that he had that he wouldn't give up, and so so therefore there wasn't an oper there was an operation, yeah, or a, or a, or a uh, yeah an operation to deal with that. That's about as simple as I can put it. Yeah, and I just wanted to bring that up because the way they do it is they do sneak some gas into the house. You go, you do get a little bit discombobulated. Then they start putting the special effects on board, and so forth. Um. Well, right. we we actually we, we were we actually did one on I I did a, I did I mentioned this in one of our episodes uh, a few years ago uh, where I, uh, a a full bird Air Force Colonel um, had uh, stumbled onto a highly classified project that he didn't have a need to know, and he told some information about this to his wife and then to some others. And we had to go in there and convince him that uh, he needs to shut his mouth. We we tried to uh, confront him, but he, that didn't work. So we actually set up a, a abduction scenario where we actually had a person uh, dressed in a suit. I personally didn't think the, the oh, suit looked real. Oh, that was the other night, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> looked real, but it fooled him. And so there were there are some cases where uh, the abductions are staged for some particular reason. And that's verified by Richard Doty, ladies and gentlemen. And yes. I, I know about it. It's good to have the team here so we can all talk about it freely. When one person says it, you know, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, okay. Um, what I'm going to get at next is a pretty, pretty good, uh, pretty good deep question. You know, everyone's talking about Antarctica. Uh, we know the Germans were there. People want to know, uh, Edna, uh, Shada Shada wants to know, gentlemen, any new information of Ana Antarctica? Do ET races still there? Um, are there structures visible with the melting snow? I, for one, can definitely comment on the structures being melted, even though Google Earth won't let you see there. Um, there's one that's melting at a, a very rapid rate, and it's very, very large. It's been sticking out now for the last three years, four years and they can't hide it and everyone always asks me when is disclosure who's going to be the major disclosure person and i'm like gaia oh not gaia tv gaia the planet earth is going to show it and no one's going to be able to stop it so i would love for you know i know tim and you richard and david too knows a lot about you know the history of that but the question is you know any new information that you're uh, that you're allowed to share and are they still there well, let me just say that uh, in uh, a few years ago, in, in 2016, the United States uh, government, uh, military, tested two energy weapons down in Antarctica in a cave uh, uh, under the under the ice. Uh, Zeus was one of the, uh, it was called Project Zeus. Uh, and the other one is, though the name of it is classified, but they they tested this energy weapon that they they created probably from the ETs, and it created 
it, it was um, it was kind of like the uh, Trinity site. They didn't know exactly how massive the destruction would be, and that's why they chose Antarctica and under the ice. So uh, they tested it at what they thought was low energy, but it created a cavern uh, hundreds of thousands of square feet, more uh, three times more than uh, what that was anticipated. And I don't want to steal any uh, uh, thunder from anybody. I have to credit some of this to uh, Linda Bolton Howell. She uh, had a source that talked about this. Uh, the second weapon system that they they tested uh, one month, exactly 30 days later, at a different place on the apparently on the other side of Antarctica, Antarctica under the ground, uh, was another energy weapon, but it was different in some re some respect, and that caused another huge cavern of bigger than what they would have anticipated. Some similar to what Open Oppenheimer, of course, a new movie came out said about Trinity. The detonation at Trinity site, they weren't, he wasn't sure if it would destroy Earth, but the, but that's something, something that were tested down there. So uh, we know that uh, we found some uh, relics down there. We found some, uh, we found a old submarine under the ice, did a, a show on Gaia regarding that. And uh, it was proven by the United States Navy later. Um, and so I know Tim has a lot of information to share on this, and I'll turn it over to Tim. Yeah, I, I try to be. Um, I yeah, I'm yeah, I'm trying my best to to sum it up. Again, sensitive topic, but um, I've I've seen tons and tons of documents. Um, you know, firsthand documents from World War II that uh, how they how they prepared. Uh, certain youth, uh, not youth, or U-boats, uh, submarines in order to go there, um, the way they set it up, the the way they recruited personnel. Most people may, might know that there used to be this lifeborn situation in Germany where uh, people were um, born, you know, uh, in order uh, without, you know, a tangible mother and dad, and they were sent there. Um <laughs> Yeah, that happened. Um, the The most recent information um, I've read is that the huge underground cities um, with, you know, typical German names um, like Dresden, for example, New, New Dresden um, that, that are built there. Uh, I've I've read some of the social structure that they have there, the way they structure their kindergartens and the way they still, you know, work on genetic modification because there were only like a few thousand Germans in the 1940s going there. And now we have seven million uh, that, you know, cannot, you know, you, you can't naturally do that. Um yeah, and the most recent thing that I've read is, um, and and you have all the nations, you know, if if they come, they have only one thing they all agree upon, and that is Antarctica. You know, they all, all, all nations yeah. are in some kind of conflict, but they all agree upon uh, Antarctica, which is kind of weird, right? So, um, we have this Antarctica Treaty, and the most recent information that I've heard is uh, that the Germans basically, and I don't know if there are any left there. But uh, they kind of disappeared uh, and, you know, built something else elsewhere. Yeah, that's definitely true. And I can definitely support that. About seven years ago, they were already, um, you know, you can't join the UN unless you sign the Antarctic Treaty saying you can't right. go there. That's without first the thing, eh? so you guys can verify that, right? The other interesting yep. thing that was told to me during that meeting is they're already collecting things from Tibet, from the Mayans, archeological uh, stuff in Peru, even Samoa, artifacts that they're going down there spreading them all out, they're burying them and they're taking all the good stuff out because they are gonna let the universities go down there into the, the real deep stuff. You know, not that those superficial, you know, you know, I have colleagues that like fly down there and they think they're actually gonna get, you know, ask a couple of people at the airport there and around the surrounding you know, 10 acre farm there. Can I, have you seen anything? It just makes me laugh because there's so much more 
to Antarctica that's there that we, of course, we know about. We probably take that for granted. But they are also establishing a disinformation campaign, sorry, Rick, that they're going to be doing under the ice with all the stuff that's down there. How they're going to release it, I don't know. That came from a very reliable source. First. Now I realized that everything that I was briefed into and everything I've done from 1979 until 1988, and even through my time at, at the Institute for Advanced Studies, is, is real. We, 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 we have been contacted. We did have a crash site in Roswell. And uh, everything else I, I experienced during that time is factual. I want to thank each and one of each and every one of you guys for you know coming up here.